the fan on. Excellent. Good morning, everybody. I am Elizabeth Taylor. I'm the executive director of the National Health Law Program, InHelp. For those of you who don't know InHelp, we are an organization that has been working for more than 45 years using our legal expertise to improve access to quality health care for low-income individuals. On behalf of all of us at InHelp, we welcome you to this important conversation about health disparities and the fight to achieve health equity. And I first want to thank the Kaiser Family Foundation for giving us this beautiful space. The Kaiser Family Foundation is a wonderful partner in this fight for health equity. Um, a note about social media. We encourage you to share the events of this morning on social media. Um, if you are tweeting, please use the hashtag health equity, no spaces, and follow InHelp on Facebook and Twitter. Many of you in this room have worked for years to eliminate disparities in health care and in health, and you follow generations of people who have appreciated the cost and the unfairness of these health disparities. The Affordable Care Act was a significant step forward, thanks to the efforts of many of you. So we need to pause and celebrate that accomplishment and the potential in the Affordable Care Act to address health disparities and to move closer to health equity. And I think our uh, speakers today will certainly do that. But we can't pause too long to celebrate because there is a lot of work still to be done. In 2016, it should not be the case that there are individuals in this country without insurance who have to choose between health care and putting food on the table. It should not be the case that the life expectancy varies by 20 years in zip codes in one metropolitan area. It should not be the case that people who don't speak English risk their lives when they go to the emergency room because they can't communicate with their doctors. It should not be the case that low-income children, many of whom are uh, racial and ethnic minorities, lack essential health care, including mental and behavioral health care, that they need to stay in school and succeed in school. And it should not be the case that people with pre-existing conditions are still discouraged by drug pricing strategies from signing up for health insurance plans. So we have cause to celebrate, and we have a lot of work ahead of us still to do. Our organization, the National Health Law Program, is committed to making health equity a reality. And we are delighted that we partner with so many of you in this room in that effort. But you didn't come to hear from me. The four speakers who have joined us today have been walking the walk in the fight toward health equity for a long time, and I am delighted to be able to introduce you to them. So first, let me introduce Congresswoman Donna Christensen. Dr. Christensen was a delegate to Congress from the Virgin Islands from 1997 to 2015. Among other significant accomplishments in Congress, she chaired the Congressional Black Caucus's Health Brain Trust and worked tirelessly to ensure that the Affordable Care Act would provide the tools needed to tackle racial and ethnic disparities. She was the first female physician elected to Congress. And you have in your folders a long list of her accomplishments, so I'm not going to go through any more of them. I'm just going to turn the mic over to Congresswoman Christensen. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you so much. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to, welcome to all. It's really wonderful to see so many of you here, and I am really encouraged by, and happy to see the great turnout of support for 150 years of Obamacare and the effort to achieve, even more importantly, the effort to achieve health equity, which is what the book, and I can say Daniel's life work and the life work of many of us in this room is all about. So I want to thank, begin by thanking also the National Health Law Program for hosting this important discussion this morning and the Kaiser Family Foundation for their hospitality and support. 
But more importantly, I want to thank both of those organizations for the work that you do to advance the health and improve the well-being of communities of color and the poor and the disenfranchised. As you heard, I had the honor and privilege of heading the Congressional Black Caucus's Health Brain Trust, founded by Congressman Lou Stokes for 16 years, thanks to the collaboration and the support of the Congressional Black Caucus. There were many highlights of that time, but one of the ones that I'm most proud of is the creation of the Lou Stokes Health Policy Fellowship. That fellowship, which is housed at the CBC Foundation, brought many outstanding scholars and advocates for health equity to the Hill and to our offices. All of them have made us proud by the work that they did with us and the work that they've done after. But they were none more brilliant and, or more totally committed to health equity and the elimination of health disparities than Daniel Dawes, who you'll hear from later. We were so fortunate to have him and to have him work with us at a very pivotal time. In 2006 and 2007, when he was in our office, we were rewriting then and perfecting and expanding on the Health Equity and Justice Act, which later became the Health Equity and Accountability Act of 2007. It's that legislation and its reiterations that became the foundation for the benchmarks that we developed in preparation for the health care reform process. They were ready when the Senate began its hearings and its meetings in preparation for reform. And though not invited, no one in the House was ever invited to those Senate meetings. Once we heard about them, I attended them armed with what our office, with the help of Daniel and our organizational partners had helped us to develop. Then when Democrats achieved the majority in the 111th Congress, his work with us in the preceding years also helped us to prepare for the first hearing on that bill after more than five years of waiting. To know that bill, the Health Equity and Accountability Act, and it's to see how much it determined the benchmarks that were set and eventually the health equity provisions of the Affordable Care Act. The bill included, for example, provisions that would increase workforce diversity, expand data collection to include race, ethnicity, language, disability, and other demographic factors. It would require a strategic plan to eliminate health disparities and increase the authority and the number of the offices of, health, of minority health at HHS, all of which became landmarks of health equity in the final bill and law. There were other provisions, such as the creation of health empowerment zones, which were never fully incorporated but became the blueprint for the community transformation grants. It's interesting to note that like our health equity legislation, these zones were created in the state of Maryland. And this speaks to something that Daniel says in the book, which is that we must never overlook the importance of also including state and local leaders in our advocacy because they're often able to lead by first enacting legislation that the federal government will later follow. So when Daniel told me and told Britt that he was going to write this book, we were just overjoyed to know that a little known but very important part of the health equity story would finally be told. I can remember at the Morehouse School of Medicine graduation a few years ago, the two of us trying to come up with titles for the book. And never in my wildest dreams did I come up with anything close to 150 years of Obamacare. <laughs> and I wondered about the title until I read the book. And I'm not alone, I'm sure, because I'm always asked, why 150 years of Obamacare? But the answer comes in the very first couple of chapters. And I don't know where Daniel found the time with all the other things that he has to do for the depth and breadth of research that went into tracing those over 100 years it took to get us to the Affordable Care Act. But I can understand why Nadika's wife is not anxious for him to start the next book, which is already brewing. I really learned a lot. And I was there, but I still learned a lot. I was reminded of the many battles that I've forgotten and provisions of the Affordable Care Act that I had lost track of and lost track of how they'd been implemented or not implemented. And just reading about that first Supreme Court case brought back the sense of anxiety of that period and of the scare that we had with the first erroneous reports. In my experience, and I'm sure that is true of other members of Congress who are seeking to implement any significant legislation, we could not, we would not and could not be successful without individuals, groups, and organizations advocating on the outside. Sort of what Jesse Jackson, the Reverend Jesse Jackson calls street heat. And also without some people working on the inside. 
It was true of the Minority AIDS Initiative, and it was definitely true of the ACA. So just to go back a little again, we really began our journey to health care reform in 2003 with getting the Democratic Caucus to adopt the initial principles of health equity and the subsequent introduction of the first health equity bill that I discussed briefly earlier. So when the work of creating what became the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act began in earnest, we were ready. At the very outset, we knew and steadfastly asserted that insurance would never be enough to provide equity in health care and health status or to eliminate the health disparities that have for too long played communities of color. In or around 2007, our 12 benchmarks were developed, and in 2009, the Tri Caucus combined the forces of the Black, Hispanic, and Asian caucuses in a focused and sustained effort to demand that health equity be a central goal of the reform process and of any legislation that would become its final product. And it is the combined work of that caucus, the Tri Caucus, on the inside and the National Working Group on Health Disparities and Healthcare Reform, co-founded and co-led by Daniel Dawes on the outside, collaborating together, and both of us meeting with congressional leadership and the White House more times than I'm sure President Obama would have liked, that led to the outcome that's recounted in Daniel's work and we'll talk about later. We're thankful for that book for many reasons. First, the health equity provisions, which are critical to improving the health of our people, reducing costs, and elevating our status globally, have gotten very little attention, save for discussions by the Tri Caucus. Many Americans who are benefiting from them don't even know they exist. Second, it makes clear that the health equity and other provisions have not all been funded or implemented. Third, the misrepresentations or outright lies about the ACA are clearly and totally debunked. Fourth, if one just reads chapter six, they will learn about all of the benefits that were created for us in the law. And fifth, it makes it clear that all the near deaths before and after the enactment into law, that vigilance and advocacy must continue until all of the bill is implemented and the improvements added as happened with Medicare, Medicaid, the civil rights law, and any other major legislation. And I would also have to add that we are very grateful that the book shows and appreciates all of the hard work that went into the creation of the ACA on behalf of everyone who was involved. Daniel says in his book, and I wholeheartedly agree, that no other law has prioritized health equity and the reduction of health disparities to this extent. For me, and I know for Daniel, for Dr. Bert Weinstock, who was a health policy advisor for our office and the CBC's Health Brain Trust, and who led the staff efforts and guided us, for us, this was the highlight of a lifetime. We are so grateful and consider ourselves blessed to have been a part of the work of developing this landmark law and helping to make such a positive and meaningful difference in the lives of millions of Americans and would-be Americans. But Daniel also wrote, of the ACA, that on health equity, it only provided a fraction of what is needed. So the book is not only a historical account of over a century of efforts, in particular the most recent efforts involved in the creation of the Affordable Care Act, it's also a call to action. In 150 years of Obamacare, Daniel makes it clear that the work must continue as relentlessly as before, not just to ensure the implementation of the provisions that we work so hard to include, but in recognizing that more needs to be done to once and for all eliminate health disparities, achieve health equity, and ensure that our country continues to the, be the beacon of equality and justice the world needs. So I want to thank Attorney Daniel Dawes for your contributions to our office, to the Health Brain Trust, and for the invaluable contribution of this book and in advance for all that I know you'll do in the future. So thank you everyone and thank you for your support. Thank you Congresswoman Christensen for your remarks and for your years of important work and for all of the great work that you're going to do going forward. 
Now I'd like to introduce Jocelyn Samuels. Jocelyn is Director of the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Health and Human Services. She leads that office's work to enforce federal laws that help ensure non-discrimination and equity in federally funded health and human services. Under Jocelyn's leadership, OCR recently released regulations implementing Section 1557, the anti-discrimination provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Much awaited. Prior to coming to OCR, Jocelyn was acting Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. And there's a longer list of her accomplishments also in your folder, so please join me in welcoming Jocelyn, and thank you. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thanks to all of you. I'm so delighted to be here today. I want to talk about Section 1557 and how it can help in the fight to which I know you have all been committed throughout your careers to reduce health disparities, to expand access to care and coverage, and to ensure the essential fairness of our health system. And I have worked with a number of you in this room, uh, including First Among Equals, folks at NHELP, who have done so much to educate the staff of the Office for Civil Rights and all of the community about the crying need to take steps to ensure that health care can be available to all without discrimination based on race, national origin, color, age, sex, or disability. And that's what Section 1557 is all about. And I know I don't have to tell any of you about the persistent disparities that we face in the healthcare context, about the fact that communities of color, people with limited English proficiency, people with disabilities, the LGBT community face far too many circumstances in which they are denied care or have it delayed. Health outcomes show immense disparities. The way in which people can access health insurance and health care clearly needs to be improved to ensure that we can realize the goals that we all share. And the ACA makes important, really invaluable strides in that direction. And thanks to all of you for your extraordinary support, both in the passage and enactment and the implementation of that law. Section 1557 is a critical component of that because it gives us the tools to address discrimination based on race, color, national origin, age, sex, or disability. And I am so privileged to have been able to be at the Office for Civil Rights as we worked on and finally released the final rule implementing the provisions of that law. So I'd like to tell you just a little bit about what it says. And many of you know, because your comments informed our understanding of the challenges and of the tools that you all need to make health equity a reality. So one of the first and most transformative aspects of Section 1557 is that it is the first federal civil rights law that broadly prohibits sex discrimination in health care. Stunningly enough, stunning to me as a civil rights lawyer, before 2010, there was no prohibition on federally funded health care, sex discrimination in federally funded health care. So Section 1557 fills a vital gap. And what the, the final rule makes clear is that discrimination on the basis of sex includes sex stereotyping and discrimination based on gender identity. And the final rule and the preamble go into a fair amount of detail about what that means. Among other things, it means that transgender individuals must be given access to facilities that are consistent with their gender identity. That's a fundamental principle of non-discrimination and one that we will enforce going forward. It also means that categorical exclusions of all services related to gender transition from insurance coverage are now invalid under the law. 
and it is still far too pervasive a practice in the health insurance industry to have these kinds of across-the-board categorical exclusions. And we will be working with our colleagues at HHS as well as with the insurance industry to ensure that those provisions are eliminated from health coverage policies going forward. Sex stereotyping is an important tool to ensure that people are not subject to discrimination based on their failure to conform to stereotypical notions about appropriate behavior or appearance or presentation of self by men and women. And we will evaluate whether cases that relate to sexual orientation discrimination in fact manifest discrimination based on sex stereotyping. Because if they do, we have the tools to address them under Section 1557. Another important component of the rule is its provisions on language access. And I know that that is something that NHELP has spent tremendous and invaluable resources promoting to ensure that people with indiv individuals with limited English proficiency get the language services they need to be able to communicate with their medical professionals. It is perhaps obvious and doesn't need stating that effective health care depends on people being able to communicate with their care providers. Health care can't be effective unless a person can understand what a doctor is saying and make themselves understood so that the doctor can effectively diagnose and treat whatever the conditions are. So the rule sets out in no uncertain terms that language services are a critical component both of providing effective health care and avoiding national origin discrimination. Every entity that is covered under the rule is obligated to take reasonable steps to provide meaningful access to people with limited English proficiency to the health programs that they engage in. We lay out in some detail in the preamble the kinds of factors we'll consider in making a determination about whether that standard has been met. Among them are whether an entity has and has implemented an effective language access plan. Because as a practical matter, if you don't think in advance about how you're going to be able to provide the language services you need when people with limited English proficiency show up in your office, you are not going to be able to meet the standards of the law. So we are looking forward to working with covered entities across the board in order to ensure that they understand the nature of the planning and the way in which they can be best positioned, both to meet the requirements of the rule and more importantly, to provide effective health care. We also have extensive requirements for people with disabilities, including requirements that um, ensure that people with hearing and vision or mobility impairments will be able to have effective communication with their health care providers and with health insurers. That obviously is as critical for people with disabilities as for people with limited English proficiency. And we have been working with many of you in this room to ensure that those provisions are robust and will be proactively enforced. We have extensive provisions that apply to insurance. And that's because for the first time under the ACA, the insurance industry is more systematically receiving federal financial aid than ever before. Because many insurers participate on the marketplaces, we say that is a form of federal financial aid that thereby subjects all of their activities, if they are principally engaged in health coverage, to the demands of Section 1557. And so our rule lays out what those requirements are with regard to ensuring that insurance coverage is provided without regard to race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability. Perhaps also notably for people in this room, the rule makes clear that HHS itself will be accountable under the same standards that we are planning to hold covered entities outside the government to. And I know that 
you will all help. And in fact, you're in the process of helping to make sure that we abide by those standards. So thanks to all of you. Um, but it is clear that in HHS's own administration of health programs, whether it is certifying insurance companies to participate in the marketplace, or delivery of Medicare and Medicaid, or our community health centers, we are committed to ensuring that our operations abide by the same standards and commitments to non-discrimination and health equity that we expect of health providers across the country. So I'm going to stop now and just conclude by saying thank you to all of you for your commitment, for your work, for your efforts to help make our health system more fair and to ensure that people can access the health care they need regardless of their race, their color, their national origin, their age, their sex, or their disability. We very much look forward to working with you in the days ahead to ensure that this rule is implemented and that the true promise of the ACA becomes a reality. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jocelyn and Donna. And we're going to do some musical chairs now, so let me thank you both. and bring our panelists up. Ah, good. Excellent. So for the next few minutes, um, First, I'm going to introduce the panelists, but, but after I introduce them, um, each of them is going to take a few minutes to make a presentation, but then we're going to save time for questions. So be thinking of your questions as they make their presentations. Our first panelist, Daniel Dawes, um, whom you've been hearing about this morning, is the Executive Director of Government Affairs and Health Policy at the Morehouse School of Medicine and is a lecturer of health law and policy at Morehouse's Satcher Health Institute. As you've heard, Daniel has spent much of his life fighting for health equity. Uh, and during the months leading up to the Affordable Care Act, Daniel founded and chaired the National Working Group on Health Disparities and Health Reform, which played a significant role in crafting the provisions of the Affordable Care Act that give us the tools to fight health disparities. Daniel is also the author of 150 Years of Obamacare, which is both a wonderful um, historical context for the more recent uh, struggle to enact the Affordable Care Act and an insider's view of that, of those last years of uh, working to get the health equity provisions into the Affordable Care Act. So I recommend the book to you. Our second panelist, Mara Udelman, is the managing attorney of the DC Office of the National Health Law Program. Mara has worked at InHelp for more than a decade on issues that include Medicaid, health reform, language access, and racial and ethnic disparities. Mara and Daniel actually worked together along with other members of the National Working Group on Health Disparities and Health Reform in advocating for the provisions of the Affordable Care Act that focus on health equity. And Mara is, as you've heard, a nationally recognized expert on language access. So Daniel and Mara, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Welcome. And Elizabeth, thank you so much for that warm introduction. And thank you, Congresswoman Christensen, for your warm um, comments as well, very generous comments, and for your mentorship. Very few can claim to have such an incredible mentor like you. So thanks to you, and thanks to everyone in this room. It feels like a family reunion. Um, and I thank all of you for making this all possible, for helping us to push a health equity agenda in the Affordable Care Act. So this book really is our collective stories. And I hope you two will um, reminisce and enjoy going back into the past for a moment um, and uh, help us uh, actually accelerate this even more as we move forward. So 
one of the things um, you know, I get asked about is, why 150 years? And we've heard President Obama, we've heard Vice President Biden say, we've been trying to do this for 100 years. Have you all heard that before? You've heard other people say 100 years, right? And um, we're saying, well, that's not necessarily the case. And it's because of this group. And, and I have to give a shout out to Mara, because, and to the National Health Law Program, of course, because if it weren't for NHELP, if it wasn't for your leadership as well, Mara, we would not have accomplished a lot of this stuff. It, NHELP made it possible so that we could put a lot of the resources that all of your different groups provided, information on racial and ethnic minority issues, uh, LGBT, disability, um, older adults, children, et cetera, and uh, we were able to put it on the website. Folks in, on Capitol Hill were able to access that from the website. And then you also actually um, added additional stuff to the, to the website and um, helped make it possible for us to write this book. So thanks again to that. And I'll tell you, even when we were creating this group, you know, we had to be careful that we didn't call it a coalition because there were coalitions that came together um, and helped form this working group. So one day I said to Mara, what in the world do we call this? We're in one of our meetings, and Mara says, well, it's a working group. So let's call it a working group. That's what it is. So kudos to you again, Mara. Kudos to the end, and kudos to everyone. So why 150 years? It's because we recognized at the time that if we were truly going to reform healthcare in this country, it had to be comprehensive. And there was this strategy from the White House and from health reformers in Congress where they, you know, as the Tea Party movement heated up, uh, we went away from calling this comprehensive health reform to health reform. But then things got really heated in the August recess in 2009. You all remember that during the town halls? Okay. And it was after that um, experience where you saw the president and you saw champions in Congress uh, saying, you know what, we're going to call this health insurance reform. And this working group actually held them accountable and said, absolutely not. During the campaign, um, Barack Obama promised us that he was going to make health equity a key component of the Affordable Care Act, of health reform negotiation. And, um, and so we pushed back. So we're going to actually take a look because what we were striving to do, this is Lady Columbia, some have called her Lady Justice, whoever you want it to be. And we all know that in this country, we haven't always been fair to our most vulnerable groups. We've had people slipping through the cracks, so to speak. We've made it very difficult for them to access health services, preventive services, et cetera. And what we were trying to do with Obamacare was to strengthen and expand the safety net for these groups. And not just in terms of health insurance reform, which are really key, because that's what most of the folks are focusing on when they say 100 years, but we wanted to expand that to include minority health reforms, to include mental health reforms. And as you know, so why advance this? Here was the argument we first had to make. We actually made a moral argument. We said 83,000 racial and ethnic minorities are dying. We didn't even have the numbers for Latinos. This is really African Americans. We didn't have it for Latinos. We didn't have it for Asian Americans, uh, Native Hawaiians, Alaska Natives, et cetera. We didn't have it for the LGBT populations. We didn't have numbers for disability groups. So we had to go with this number and try to push and, and pray that folks would actually pay attention and, and um, address it in the bill. But then during um, the summer of 2009, uh, folks on Capitol Hill said, well, that's nice, that's too bad, rather, um, that folks are dying. We've got to actually get numbers. What will these um, reforms do to bend the cost curve in the United States? And thank God for two professors, um, Johns Hopkins University and Professor at George Washington University, we had a health economist do a study, and they came up with a very conservative number because they knew that opponents of our efforts to reform the system would actually try to attack the methodology. So they came with a very conservative number, $300 billion. They, in fact, believe that it's actually more money that we're spending due to these disparities. And that's just racial and ethnic disparities. We haven't even um, looked at the other disparate groups yet. But the other argument that we made to continue to drive this um, as strategies changed within the administration and Congress was that it's not on, this is not an isolated issue. It's, it impacts the social and the economic vitality of uh, communities. And we raise this as a national security issue to really get their attention. And the other argument we made was that policy has been a driving force for many of the disparities that we've observed in communities across the United States. So policy should be a driving force for helping us to address these issues. And here was a great opportunity for us to do so in the law. So let me take you back 150 years. This is really key. And let's start with mental health for a second. We know mental health is a, a very sexy topic right now. We've been hearing about opioid addiction. We've been hearing about other issues with gun violence and so forth. Well, 
more than 150 years ago, you know, a woman by the name of Dorothea Dix, a health equity champion, then tried to push for mental health reforms. And there were, of course, other uh, mental health reformers that were pushing for this bill for the benefit of the indigent insane. And she pushed, she pushed, she spent decades trying to get it through, and finally convinced Congress to do so. They did pass the law, only to have the president at the time, Franklin Pierce, President Pierce, who should have been the most sympathetic president on mental health reform, actually veto it. And he vetoed it despite the fact. So he actually, why say, why do I say sympathetic? He actually, on the day of his inauguration, when he was um, uh, with his family, his wife and his uh, son, they were actually coming from a funeral on a train. So trains were a new innovation at the time. And unfortunately, it got into an accident. And the only person to die that day was his son. Died tragically, his skull split open. Um, wife was horrified by what she saw. Of course, suffered terrible anxiety, um, depression, and so forth. And he himself um, became a, a, an addict, a um, substance user. And so instead of signing that, he actually vetoed it. And in one of the longest veto messages I have ever read, and I know Mari and others will agree with me, it actually um, set the federal policy of not getting involved in human welfare issues for the next 100 years in terms of mental health. It was amazing. And after 100 years, we did manage to get uh, some piecemeal legislation around the issue with Truman and then um, uh, Kennedy and Johnson and Eisenhower, et cetera but not, never enough, never comprehensively addressing the issues impacting people with mental illness. Until 1980, when President Carter comes into office, and he and his wife um, basically worked diligently to get this Mental Health Systems Act passed. They finally got it done two months before the November 1980 election, and we all know what happened there. President Reagan um, won the election, and his administration went about immediately uh, to prevent further implementation of that bill and to actually dismantle um, the entire program. So it shouldn't be a surprise then, during our efforts around um, health reform, um, Obamacare, that we managed to put a lot of those principles, a lot of those policies, in the Affordable Care Act, it's something that we championed 30 years after that effort. Now let's go to minority health. So, unfortunately didn't get as, um, as far as minority health reformers. In minority health, these individuals managed to get the Freedmen's Bureau Act passed, right? Huge medical division, they're pushing forth uh, reforms to increase access to care in um, you know, different communities across the country. And unfortunately, that law was only allowed to stand seven years. So keep that in mind, seven years that was allowed. Mental health reform under Carter, just a few months, uh, minority health reform, seven years, and then there was no more appetite in this country during that time to afford racial and ethnic minorities access to care. Very horrible uh, part of our history there. Why does that matter? It took us another 120 plus years before Congress then passed a very piecemeal uh, legislation called the Disadvantaged Minority Health Improvement Act. And this was under the George H.W. Bush administration. And they worked with um, the Congressional Black Caucus, of course, with Louis Stokes at the time, and with Ted Kennedy and Bill Frist. And they made it a bipartisan effort. They pushed forth this piecemeal, uh, I mean, significant at the time, but still very piecemeal. And so we, um, we pushed further, of course, from that time until then and put a lot of the reforms um, that were lost into the Affordable Care Act. Now, universal health, the piece that most of us think about or most um, health reformers are thinking about is the universal um, health uh, issue. And every single time folks tried to pass a universal health coverage, would you believe folks would infuse race and gender into the debates to discredit efforts to push this uh, movement further? So with that said, it's been a very um, big struggle over 150 years, and I want to take us back now to this issue of health equity specifically, how we manage now to push. And thankfully, in 1983, we all know the story of Margaret Heckler. I won't go through this um, in depth, but she actually recognized after external advocates uh, many of you might know them, pushed externally and said, Margaret, you have got to work, you have got to address the crisis, the minority health crisis in the United States. And she recognized that while the overall health of the nation had been improving, the health of disparate groups was actually alarming. And so she established this task force that then created this report, and it led to the establishment of the Office of Minority Health, huge at the time. But Congressman Stokes, the members of the Black Caucus, and others 
uh, recognized that in order for them to make sure that it was stable, they wanted to codify it into law. And that's that 1990 law. That's how you got that law passed. And it actually then uh, granted the, it, uh, it authorized the first million dollars to do health disparities research. That was critical because that research then left, led to additional um, efforts in um, policy. And interestingly enough, at the same time that 1990 bill passed, the Healthy People, our nation's public health agenda, very um, boldly prioritized reducing health disparities. And Lewis, Lewis Sullivan, Dr. Sullivan will tell you that was no easy feat. That was against um, you know, many of his advisors. They said, don't do that. Do not prioritize reducing health disparities. That is too controversial an issue. But he still went ahead with um, uh, true leadership and push forth. And so you get a sense of the bills there. You get a sense of the Healthy People 2010 under Dr. Satcher. David Satcher then says, you know what? Why do we have these separate um, and unequal standards for different racial and ethnic groups, right, or different groups? Why don't we have a um, standard across the board for everyone? And so he moved us away from reducing disparities. He says we can eliminate health disparities. And thanks to the Clinton administration, we then had that for the first time ever um, as a priority. And that then led to that 2000 bill, the Minority Health and Health Disparities Research and Education Act. And that authorized the Institute of Medicine's unequal treatment report. It actually led to the um, uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality looking at this on an annual basis to track the disparities among different groups. And um, that then led to additional policies throughout um, our, our, our decade. So let me go now right before the ACA. We have all this um, information about disparities. We have everything that we need. Now we're armed to um, provide some evidence-informed policies to our members of Congress. And, um, and that's where we then decided, when we heard that folks internally in Congress, in the House and the Senate side, when we heard they were meeting behind closed doors, they were actually um, strategizing, trying to figure out what uh, could happen, what was possible in 2008. So this was before the election. Um, we started getting things off the ground, too, to make sure that this legislation, the Affordable Care Act, actually was a comprehensive health reform uh, package and that it reduced, uh, prioritized not only the reduction but the elimination of health disparities. So what is this graph about? So the group that we um, established actually did all we could to throw as many provisions in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the stimulus law. And we recognized, gee, just in case we don't get another opportunity, to push some of this agenda, let's take advantage of ARA. So comparative effectiveness research, there's some um, issues dealing with cultural competency. We managed to get that in ARA. And that's really the foundation, though, for the Affordable Care Act. That's how I see it. And with the ARA established, President Obama himself recognized that he could have stopped there and said, you know what, check, I accomplished health reform. But he didn't. He moved ahead and he pushed his um, administration to get it done. And thankfully, we have the ACA. Today, we have 62 provisions in the law, thanks to many of you in this room, that directly address this issue of disparities in health, health status and health care among vulnerable populations. And now, of course, we have an extension of the ACA, the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act, MACRA, which is surprising to many people. We were wondering whether the Republican-led Congress would actually reauthorize a lot of these health equity programs that were um, sunsetting. They were expiring around the time that MACRA passed. And believe it or not, they actually did pass it by bipartisan basis. They got it done, thankfully. And I actually call this the Health Reform Extension Bill because they extended the delivery and payment system reforms uh, from the ACA. So wanted to share with you the five health equity principles that were girding the ACA. So many of you might recall this effort. Um, when we were at the American Psychological Association and we were negotiating. These were the five principles that we came up with and um, actually kept us up to late in maybe two in the morning sometimes trying to negotiate these. So every single one of these words have meaning, so appreciate them. Um, but you get the five sense of, of the five areas that we really focused on, from health insurance coverage to um, cultural competency to data collection and reporting to healthcare quality and accountability. 
And in there, you get a sense of the 62 provisions that I'm talking about. Obviously, can't go through all of this stuff, but we managed to get provisions. The strategy was to make sure we didn't have one dedicated title to health disparities in the law. We wanted to have it um, fleshed out throughout the law, just in case the Supreme Court decided they were going to nix uh, part of the law, we would have some still uh, left in there that we could implement. So uh, there again, uh, part of the 62, and uh, you heard the non-discrimination, which was huge for us, data collection reporting, which is really huge. And I think that we need to continue to press HHS to make sure they are implementing that piece. Um, and then, of course, with the health insurance exchanges, you all know that there is this requirement that in order to be a qualified health insurance plan in the exchange, you have to provide, you have to develop a strategy for incentivizing providers who actually are developing programs to address the issue. So um, very pleased with some of those. And then, of course, we have seven national strategies now um, because of this, uh, this law prioritizing health equity. Um, not only by the AC, but executive order of the president. But all of these now, for the first time ever, are saying, you know what, if you're in the quality space, you need to address the intersection of quality and equity. If you're in the prevention space, you also need to do likewise. Um, health literacy strategy, of course, prioritizes that. HIT, or any of you in health information technology, we want to make sure that you're looking at this issue, too, because we all know that there is a digital divide depending on your community. So. We all know that um, we're marching towards health equity. We're very pleased. Um, we know that this uh, law actually um, is benefiting the groups that we wanted it to. Um, obviously, not as fast as uh, many of us would like, but um, you know, there, the struggle does continue. We know there have been 10 brushes with death uh, to date, and um, the book actually highlights that this could be, this November, could be the 11th brush with death and the most fatal. Um, if we are not careful. I think the Supreme Court has made it clear, Chief Justice Roberts, um, that uh, if they want to, if opponents want to um, uh, repeal or dismantle this law, they actually have to do so through the political process. There have been two successful strategies to date of, we, as we all know, the, using their hearing powers to shed a negative light on the law and, of course, using the budget um, process uh, to push forth, um, you know, and, and this is where you see back and forth the administration versus Congress. But every time there's a contentious budget negotiation, it's always resulted in a chipping away of the law. And we've had 16 successful attempts today to repeal or modify that. But, of course, one major challenge, um, despite the fact that we've made significant gains and I'm very happy that this is the lowest uninsured rate we've ever witnessed in our country in recorded history, 9.1%. Um, and here you see a graph actually highlighting how we've come from 1963 until the present. And look at that drop from 1963 when Medicare and Medicaid uh, was created, was established. Look at that drop of 10% almost, right? And, and then, of course, more drop when they expanded Medicare and Medicaid. And then things started rising after, the, um, after 1980. And uh, you get a sense then with the Obamacare, with the Affordable Care Act, that there was a drop. So there were basically two phases of this with the early retiree reinsurance program with PSIP um, and expanding coverage to you know, uh, dependents up to the age of 26. So we saw that bending the uninsurance rate, but not as fast. Second um, phase of that with the first open enrollment from that time until now, we've seen a, a, a precipitous decline as well. But can you imagine if every single state were expanding Medicaid, how much further we would be in terms of the uninsurance rate? So huge issue for us. The projections aren't aligning with historical trends. We've been tracking. We looked at the um, original Medicaid program. We looked at SCHIP to see when they're established, to see how quickly states actually um, agreed to establish their programs. And within seven years, virtually every um, state uh, established their programs, their Medicaid programs in the 1960s or their SCHIP program. Um, but we do not see that happening right now. And um, we actually apparently didn't put that graphic in there, but if by the rate we're going, it will take us twice as long to get every state to expand Medicaid. And so we need your help, especially in the South, uh, for folks like me who live in Georgia and uh, other states. We really do need to think about how we can push these uh, state lawmakers, these governors, to do the right thing. I know that some are in um, meetings behind closed doors. They're trying to figure it out. But I think they've dug their heels in so far with their constituents, it's making it more difficult. Because as soon as folks sniff that there is money in a state appropriation um, bill, 
uh, there in our state of Georgia, for instance, then they immediately go after the uh, governor not to sign that into law. So there's some issues uh, happening there, and of course you get a sense of the states that are involved. There's another major challenge that I want to talk about in terms of um, what we see coming on the horizon, and it's this issue of um, quality and healthcare disparities. And um, as many of you might recall back in 2001, you heard me talk about the unequal treatment report. But there's another report that actually said, listen up, guys, as you're improving quality in the United States, you've got to address one of the six components of quality. If you're truly going to achieve quality in this country is equity. And these two reports together actually highlight this issue that um, we are now concerned about, especially safety net providers like us um, in the South. So in the North, or actually across the United States. So in the North, take a look at this, um, this uh, map of the U.S. That actually shows the level of quality in the country. And the states that have higher healthcare quality scores um, are virtually in the North and Midwest. These actually are the states that have the highest healthcare disparities among racial and ethnic groups. And that's always surprising to folks. You look at the, um, the states in the South, we tend to have lower quality of care. But look at the second map below that. We actually don't have the type of disparities that the Northerners do and Midwesterners. Um, that's because the quality of care is suboptimal, right? It's lower quality. So everybody's getting bad care. But as we move now and we drive towards higher quality of care, this is why we've got to take a look at how it intersects with equity. And folks will say, well, why is that happening? Yes, it is a resource issue. That's partially true. But the other issue is that it does not take an equity lens when they are developing different models. So as we move forward with these delivery and payment system reforms, we've got to think about that. So I'm going to close here and say, give this quote by Marion Wright Edelman, which I love, where she says, a new president or Congress is only going to be as good as the citizens outside demanding it. So as we move forward and as we have a new Congress and a new administration next year, I'm urging you to continue your advocacy and push them to make sure that we continue to see a more accessible, equitable, and person-centered healthcare system. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Daniel. It's, it's um, really a pleasure for me to be up here with Daniel. He is one of the folks in the room, along with a lot of other of you, who I won't say are old friends, because I shouldn't say that, um, especially because I'm getting up there too now, but friends who I've known a long time and have worked with these issues on a long time. Um, and it really is a pleasure to have Daniel up here with us and to call him a friend, and also to be able to call him an author now um, and to read this book. And so I do encourage you, if you haven't taken a look at his book yet, please do. Um, and uh, give it a good read because it, 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 you'll learn stuff new, you'll learn new stuff as well as uh, reliving some of the, the fun we had, shall we say, <laughs> as we were working to craft the ACA. I'm going to build on what Daniel was talking about and try to take us to the next step, which is, okay, we've made tremendous gains, and we really have had 150 years of Obamacare, and we've made great successes, but where do we go? We still do have a lot to work, and the Congresswoman said that, I think we've seen some of the recent um, advances with the release of the final Section 1557 regulations, as Jocelyn from OCR said, um, but our work isn't done. And so um, one of the things that I do want to distinguish is the health equity versus health disparities, and this actually flows really well from those maps that Daniel just put up on the screen. When we're talking about health equity, we're really trying to make sure that everyone has the, full, has the opportunity to obtain their full health potential. And the disparities is what exists when people aren't having that opportunity to gain their full health, per, health potential. I've taken the slide, which, or this uh, graphic, which some of you may have seen going around on Facebook recently. I've adapted it. Um, but I think this really shows, because a lot of times we think of, oh, well, if we give everyone the same thing, well, they have the potential to, to, to get what they need and to move forward. And I think it's the um, left-hand side of the slide. Well, if everyone has the same kind of box, it's not going to help everyone in the same way. And we really do need to be thinking about either targeted interventions or looking at things with a health equity lens and really identifying what we need to make sure that everyone can, in this case, see over the baseball fence. And since I'm going to a baseball game tomorrow night, I like this one too. Um, but also just everyone needs that opportunity. And we can't assume that we all come from the same place, have the same background, have the same needs, have the same access, that giving us all the same is going to need it. We do have to recognize that depending on historical disadvantages, historical racism, historical um, dis, um, disenfranchising, and being underserved, that we may need to actually have some targeted interventions. 
So in terms of the National Health Law Program, and you have some of this information in your folders as well, um, health equity has been a major part of NHELP's history since we were founded in 1969. Um, and very early on, some of the work we did involved litigation. We wrote an amicus brief in Roe v. Wade, um, as well as many of the more recent women's health and reproductive justice cases that have gone to the Supreme Court. Um, we, off, we also led the Office of Management and Budget to develop policies to collect racial and ethnic data beyond white, black, and other, which is how they used to do that. That arose out of litigation that we filed a couple of decades ago. Um, and we also work to ensure that all Medicaid enrollees get the care they're entitled to and get the services they're entitled to. On the policy realm, um, this is actually one of the first projects that I got assigned when I joined NHELP back in 2000, um, was at that point there was a myth that said, well, you know, if I'm a health care provider, federal law prohibits me from collecting race, ethnicity, and language. I can't do that. And it ended up being a myth that we debunked as lawyers looking at every single federal statute, regulation, policy, and federal database to say actually nothing prohibits you from collecting that data and there's actually a lot of positive reasons to collect that. Um, so we were able to debunk that myth and really move the path forward in helping recognize there is a strong need to collect data because it can help identify disparities and also identify where the interventions aren't happening that we might need to, to either have enforcement actions or targeted interventions to reduce and eventually eliminate disparities. We also worked on increasing uh, Medicaid and CHIP funding for language services. Um, as you heard from Jocelyn and others in this room know and through the, the working group that Daniel led, um, and also through work we've done with the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, we helped craft the non-discrimination provision, Section 1557, and the data collection provision. So where are we now? As Daniel mentioned, we're at the lowest uninsurance rate in history, and we really should just take that minute and just reflect on it and really applaud it. It's huge, the fact, and so come on, yeah. we can applaud. <laughs> it is huge. On the other hand, we also have to recognize that we still have a number of people who've been left behind. Um, both those who are not insured, and some of whom have been completely closed out of health insurance, such as undocumented immigrants um, and other immigrants, and also as well that some are still underinsured. Some people still can't afford health care, even though they're getting tax credits through the health insurance marketplaces. And even if they have insurance, that there are still disparities. So as Daniel said, there's um, quite a few <laughs> provisions in the ACA that really help us move the health equity agenda forward. So some of them just, and this is really just the, the complete highlights, we didn't, wouldn't have time to go through all of them, but no pre-existing condition exclusions, no annual or lifetime limits, no gender rating and limited age rating, free preventive services. Section 1557 we've discussed, Section 4302 of the ACA is the provision that requires data collection. We also didn't mention the um, Patient Centers Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI, which um, has, was received a lot of money and newly founded through the ACA and does have a full focus on disparities that they've been doing and advancing the research agenda to help us then back up what we need to advance in the policy realm. So in terms of non-discrimination, we heard Jocelyn talk about the 1557 regulations. Um, and again, this is really the broad non-discrimination protection and for the first time unified in one provision, many of the pre-existing civil rights statutes. And I think that's important because you often are not looking at civil rights and discrimination in a vacuum. I'm not just a woman, but I am a white woman, and there's intersectionality there. And so someone may have a disability and be a person of color. And the fact that you previously had to look at, well, is it looking at as discrimination under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act or the Americans with Disabilities Act, 1557 brings them all together and recognizes that intersectionality, which really is critical, and the regulations do this as well. So we really are thrilled with um, the fact that we do have final regulations implementing 1557. And we are looking forward at the next steps towards the effective implementation and enforcement. So where do we need to go? Well, we're lawyers, so enforcement is always a piece of the puzzle. Um, there's a, an avenue, as many of you may know, for administrative complaints and the National Health Law Program and some of our friends in the room, including the National Immigration Law Center, the National Women's Law Center, um, and a number of the LGBT groups have all, already helped file complaints. Um, and so we're looking forward to the resolution of a number of those complaints now that we've actually seen the final regulations be released. And we're also looking forward to OCR investigating their own in investigations. They have that authority to do it. And to do a lot of outreach and education. 
If you said 1557, no one's going to really know what that means. <laughs> Maybe in this room, yes, I hope. But beyond the room, when we're talking to consumers and to patients and to our members of groups um, that have member organizations, we really need to educate them about what this means for them, what it means when they go see their health care provider, when they go to the hospital, when they're talking with their insurance company, what this means, and that they have a right to receive health care without discrimination, and they have a remedy if they don't have it. We also need to make sure, and Jocelyn mentioned this, that we implement 1557 effectively at HHS itself. This needs to apply in Medicare, in Medicaid, in the Children's Health Insurance Program, in the federally facilitated marketplace, and all of the state-based marketplaces. In addition, we need to remember that 1557 doesn't just apply to HHS. It applies to every um, health program administered or funded by the federal government. So we need to take the next steps and go beyond HHS and go to the Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs and the Office of Personnel Management and all of the other agencies that are operating health programs and make sure they also come on board with strong 1557 regulations and implementation. And then you heard Jocelyn talk that the um, regulation for the first time prohibits gender identity discrimination and discrimination on the basis of um, sex stereotypes. As we hope that the law develops in the courts, we also hope there will be an explicit direct um, uh, recognition that discrimination based on sexual orientation itself is also prohibited, not just through any sex stereotypes. In terms of data collection, again, NHELP has worked on this for much of its 50, uh, almost 50 years of history. Um, and the reason that we do it is because we have a legal hook in that many of these civil rights provisions the only way to identify discrimination or disparities is if you have the data to show it. So we need to collect better data. Um, we need also to collect disaggregated data. It's not just enough to collect data on, for example, Asian Pacific Islanders. We need subcategories. Um, as one example, right now, 14% of Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders don't have health insurance in comparison to about 9% as we heard the, the national statistic. So already it's 14% for AAPI as a group versus 9%. But if you disaggregate the data, certain subgroups actually have much higher uninsured rates. So 21% of Korean Americans are uninsured and Pakistanis, 22% of Tongans and 24% of Marshallese. We can't just rely on those national data, whether it's insurance or particular treatment and quality of conditions. So where do we need to go? We need to fully implement the ACA's provision on data collection. Um, and this is so something I hope that as we now move forward with 1557 and HHS implementation that we can really bring in 4302 and data collection as well. So as a start, for example, on applications, we really should be using best practices for collecting demographic data. We need to collect comprehensive race, ethnicity, and language data using standards that were developed by the Institutes of Medicine a number of years ago. We should be collecting disability status using at least the six questions used on the American Community Survey. Right now, the health insurance marketplace only uses one question. Uh, we should be collecting sexual orientation and gender identity, and most, not most importantly, but very importantly, we need to train the staff how to do this because many of them are fearful of it and then they don't ask or they decide, well, I'm going to identify what this person is based on what they look like as opposed to what that person self-identifies. And that doesn't help and that's not where we need to be. So we do need to do the education piece and there's actually some really good work out there about how to ask these questions and why to ask these questions. But we need to take the time. It's not just the collecting, but how do we collect, why do we collect, and making sure that there's that understanding. And of course, for consumers, these questions should be optional to answer. They must be mandatory to be asked, they should be on all of the applications, but we should not be forcing any consumers or patients or applicants to answer these questions. So moving on to um, language literacy disparities, and again, I'm really just hitting some of the very high top level issues. We could do, you know, hours of presentations on any one of these topics. We're just trying to get the conversation started. Um, but in terms of communication, Hispanics and African Americans are much more likely than whites to report poor communication. And that gap effectively has not changed over the last decade or so. There's also um, an, income uh, an income disparity as well in terms of communication. Of course, in the Affordable Care Act, we have 1557, and we have a number of other regulations implemented as part of the Affordable Care Act that require language access and disability access. But again, we're not collecting the data that we need to be collecting in order to identify where people may have language or communication issues. 
So in terms of some of the areas where we need to go with language and literacy, we really need, need to ensure that communication is happening at a low literacy level. Too many, Amer too many individuals in this country have a low literacy or a low health literacy, and if the ma materials are written too high at a level, they're not going to understand it, they're not going to be able to apply, they're not going to be able to access the coverage. In addition on language access, we need to collect robust language data. We need to make sure translation is done competently. Um, there are special skills and abilities that are needed to translate materials from English to a non-English language and back, or back um, into English, and not just anyone who may be bilingual is sufficient to do that. So we need to make sure that we have the standards in place that those providing language services, whether they are interpreters or translators or bilingual staff directly communicating with patients in a non-English language, that they are all competent and have the sufficient proficiency to do so. And we also, again, this is the training piece. We need to train providers and consumers and insurers about how to provide language access effectively and how to work with interpreters. In terms of disparities due to disability, there certainly are continued disparities on this front as well, unfortunately. So for example, just a couple of um, statistics here, adults with a disability are less likely to have a current mammogram than adults without a disability. They're also less likely to be receiving needed medical care. So 27% of people with disabilities did not receive needed medical care because of cost issues compared to 12% of people without disabilities. And people with disabilities are also less likely to receive Preventive, preventive, hair, uh, preventive care services, excuse me, um, as well. So what do we need to do in, term to, in terms of improving disability access? Again, we need to enforce the non-discrimination requirements, which not just includes physical access to offices, to um, uh, um, imaging equipment and things like that, but also mental health parity. We have to recognize that some individuals um, may need special accommodations or special hours of the day that they can come in just because of the other issues that they're um, that they are addressing in their lives. We need to collect robust disability data, also ensure competent interpreters, whether it's sign language interpreters, transliterators, or that we also have auxiliary aids and services available. We can't assume that because someone has a communication disorder that a sign language interpreter is going to assist them. We need to ask the patient what they need and how best to work with their, uh, with their needs. And again, the training issue. I want to talk a little bit now and sort of shift from healthcare and healthcare services, which is a lot of where the ACA took us, but it also took us beyond. And we need to think beyond healthcare and healthcare services as well. So healthcare is only one piece of health equity. Um, and healthcare interventions certainly are very important because they help people who are sick lead healthier lives and they provide economic security so that we're not all spending too much money and don't have um, economic stability in other parts of our lives. But we also need to look beyond this. And so we need to be thinking about the social determinants of health. And this is a slide um, that comes from HHS's Healthy People 2020. But if you look at it, it's not just health and health care, but it's the social and community context, education, economic stability, and neighborhood and the built environment. For example, NHELP does a lot of work on um, Medicaid, as you all know. And so if we look at the social determinants of health and Medicaid, there's actually a lot that states already can be doing to advance health equity and help prevent disparities that also impact social determinants of health. So for example, states can actually get waivers where managed care plans can invest in their savings to provide services that might not usually be covered in, um, in the Medicaid context. It might be helping to pay rent to maintain housing, provide dental and eyeglasses to managed care organization enrollees. Managed care organizations are also starting down this path. And Medicaid also is a money follows the person demonstration program, which can also help pay, for example, for like housing coordinators to help people transition out of insti um, institutional settings and get into the community um, and be able to find appropriate settings and to set up those, that housing um, initially with the services and um, uh, physical access that they might need. So as we go forward and we're looking, as Daniel said, at the next election, which is going to be very important, um, there are also a lot of conversations going on about Medicaid. And so as we're thinking about Medicaid, Medicaid really is the stopgap, fail-safe, critical health, public health program for right now over 70 million low-income individuals in this country. And we can't forget that. And we can't take the step backward that some would like to take us back. Um, and undermine Medicaid when it is such a critical safety net that is relied on by families, by people with disabilities, by people with limited English proficiency, by the elderly, um, and by children. So looking at the social determinants of health lens, we really need to be maintaining and strengthening Medicaid. 
we can't let go of the entitlement nature of Medicaid. There's sometimes conversations about block grants and per capita caps. That might work for other um, segments of the population, but it does not work for the Medicaid population, and we really need to make sure Medicaid is maintained as an entitlement. But we also can be exploring the linkages between Medicaid and other public health programs. So we can look at um, connecting and collaborating between food and nutrition programs, housing, education, clean water, et cetera. And we need the financial investments to support Medicaid and other public programs. We can't expect Medicaid to pay for services that other programs can, but we can make those linkages so that we can identify when a family may have um, you know, a child with asthma and might need a um, connection to either getting medical equipment or getting into a different housing environment or might need some services at school to prevent that child from having an asthma attack and going to the hospital. And we also can use Medicaid to identify some structural barriers and needed interventions. So that's a really quick snapshot and the very high-level overview. Um, and again, rather than sort of, you know, leaving on the um, note of we haven't come far, we've come tremendously far, but we can still go farther. <laughs> and we really do look forward to working with all of you continued over the next number of, of, of months, years, decades as we've gone forward, as we've been working on this for 150 years so far. Um, but let's take all the energy that we've achieved and accomplished so far and continue to push forward because there is a world out there where we don't have to be facing the health inequities that we've had and we can eliminate those disparities and that's where we want to go. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daniel and Mara. Um, we have saved a few minutes for questions. Um, and so here's how it's going to work. We have two microphones. Um, Julia and Mimi are going to work the rooms. We'll try to go from one side to the other. Wait till you have a microphone to ask a question. If you want to address it to one of the panelists, feel free, or just ask your question, and they'll figure out who to answer. Morning. Hey, Daniel, how are you? Good to see you. Um, he's my mentor, could you, actually. Could you say who you are? Sure, yes. Uh, my name is um, um, Okechuku Enya. I am a CBC Foundation Health Policy Fellow. I just, um, I just finished up my fellowship last week on the Hill. I was on the House side last year, and, I was, and now I was on the Senate side most recently, working for Senator Patty Murray. Um, it's good to see this. Uh, I love this. Uh, this this uh, conversation is very timely in that a couple of things. One, I actually helped to write the um, letter that went to HHS from my boss as it relates to, to uh, Section 50, uh, 57. Um, I also uh, drafted a bill most recently uh, centered around health and equity in all policies. Um, I think it's important to kind of flesh that out. Um, the bill is entitled um, the Health and Equity in All Policies Act of 2016. Um, where it talks about how to reauthorize programs um, to build a, to better build a culture of health and equity at the federal, state, tribal, and local levels. Um, and so I'm happy to share that as, as well, but my question and, and, and part of, um, I would think how we can perhaps move things forward uh, is to talk about how to best measure health equity, right, in terms of metrics. How do we best measure and uh, move towards uh, data and evidence to support what we're working on? Because it's one thing to, yes, have you know, um, what, uh, what's in place now, but I think in terms of the data that has been discussed, it's, it's so important to be able to, to create the, the uh, metrics that will support the work that we're talking about. Um, my last thing is that I'm looking for a job, so <laughs> folks that have a need for anyone with my background and experience. <laughs> I'm happy to have a conversation. Um, so I'm very open to talking after this uh, session here. <laughs> but you. so I'll stop there. And if anyone has an answer to that question, that, um, that'll be very helpful. So thank you. Thank you. Mara and Daniel. Sure. So actually, I just want to give kudos to OK for actually leading that effort in the Senate to make sure that the Section 1557 rule also included racial and ethnic implicit bias. Uh, that was left out, and the people with disability um, piece was also, we thought, um, watered down. So thank you guys for leading that effort. I'm going to actually turn it over to Yeah, Yeah, I, I think a lot of the initial is to, if we fully implemented the data collection provision in the ACA, within a couple of years, then we'd have robust data that we could look at. And I think a lot of the problem is that we don't have good data right now. 
um, or the data comes in bits and pieces and drips and drabs depending on which public health program, which insurer, which state, uh, which provider. Um, and that's really one reason why a lot of us on the working group pushed for this robust data collection provision um, that was as broad and comprehensive as it, as it was. And so to get that provision, you know, fully implemented and fully funded, I think would be huge. But I do think there are other levers. So, you know, we are moving and there's a lot of focus on delivery system reform. There's a lot of focus on quality issues. We need to make sure that those conversations aren't leaving behind the issues of health equity. And Daniel sort of said this, it, it, we need to be thinking broadly. So if we're looking at a delivery system reform proposal and, and NHELP has done this in meetings we've had with HHS, we've been saying we need to just as critically be thinking about not um, further leaving behind our communities, but actually affirmatively looking ahead. And so if you're basing payment methods on, you know, 15 minute intervals with a patient and many people that in our communities may be underserved and are going to need some either catch up appointments or more intensive time and training to understand their condition um, or, you know, additional visits then you've already disincentivized providers and they're going to try to cherry pick out of whether it's a person with a disability, an African American with diabetes, um, a single mother with, um, you know, in, in pregnant who may have complications, et cetera. So I think we have to really be cognizant as we're developing all these new systems and these quality metrics to not just think broadly about how we lift everyone, but really to think very clearly and concretely about making sure we're not doing things for the whole that disadvantage all the populations that we now worked so hard to advance. And, and actually, if I, you just triggered a, it reminded me of something. So Brian Smedley, many of you know him, he might actually hit me for saying this, but he's working on a health um, equity index and they're trying to figure out how they can measure when you look at the political determinants of health, you look at the social determinants of health and the physical determinants of health, how that um, works. So if you all are interested in that uh, effort, I would urge you to contact him and make sure that they're looking at it from all angles, okay, comprehensively. Yeah, thanks. I think we've got a question here. Thank you. Oh. Hi, um, my name is Bianca Palmazano. I run a um, consulting and education firm with a health equity lens. Um, I was wondering, we talked in both of your presentations about sort of the educational need for uh, talking to providers and health organizations about their responsibilities under 1557 and uh, 4302. What uh, programs are sort of moving forward or what opportunities are there to sort of do that educational work and to help providers know what their responsibilities are to prevent discrimination and to actually use an, an, equi an equity lens when they're providing care. So I understand from the rule that this might cost us, what, $900 uh, million dollars in order to educate and train folks about this rule. And I'll tell you that for us at Morehouse School of Medicine, we are convening an internal group to build awareness. But I don't know of anyone really, or at least I haven't heard yet, um, if you know, I'd love to hear who is actually going to help lead that case. Because there's so many providers, they have no clue what this means. And there's so many different rules coming and hitting them at once. So these were a few that we highlighted to say we're going to do some lunch and learns around. But um, Mara, do you know if Yeah, I mean, really I think there isn't yet sort of a coordinated focus on this. And certainly some providers have been more advanced because they've been focusing, they know about 1557 or they have populations with a high number of limited English proficient individuals so they've been focusing on language access. Um, I believe that the Office for Civil Rights usually does take, you know, sort of the first steps and will go out and do some general education and information and is always often, um, sorry, is always also available um, not even just when a complaint is filed, but an entity that is covered by this rule can get information, advice, and technical assistance. But certainly the National Health Law Program does a lot of work on training um, and education and trying to pre pre um, prepare materials. We've already prepared um, an analysis of the 1557 final rule, which is on our website. We certainly anticipate that over the coming months we'll be putting out some additional information as well. Um, and that's a role that we are happy to provide and happy to assist others with as well. Question over here. Cincy, Cincy, Julie, Julie is um, hi, Cincy Hernandez-Cancio from Families USA, and it's great to be, as you said, this is like a family yes. reunion, right? <laughs> um, so I'm really glad that the issue of the, as a challenges coming forward are what happens with delivery and payment reform. Right. And one of the questions that I have is I feel like there's a small number of us that have been talking about this for a couple of years on how this is happening without the voices 
without much voices of consumers, right. yes. let alone consumers of color. Mm. And um, I'm just wondering what you see as uh, a way or levers to start getting this um, conversation and more attention in the policy development that is needed to make sure that as alternative payment methods and all of that move forward, we are actually, number one, protecting our communities, and number two, leveraging that opportunity to fund targeted interventions that we know that work. Because the more I hear from folks, there are many very negative unintended consequences happening on many levels um, that are not getting attention. And you know, what do you suggest that we do to make sure that we start working on this more effectively? You know, thank you for that question. And I, I will tell you, we can't even get to the consumer level because we haven't even been able to get the providers to understand what this all means, right? And um, many of them are providing misinformation to their own patients. It's so, it's very disheartening. So we're trying to work to get to educate them about what this means. We've been working through our Health Equity Leadership and Exchange Network, Helen, um, to, to uh, educate and inform our policymakers. So we had Andy Slavitt come and we educated him about some of the things um, that are happening. He says that he's going to push CMS to really address the issue now um, um, and bring in you know, uh, stakeholders with expertise in this area. But we haven't seen any movement as such yet. We brought in folks from different insurance companies to say, wait a second, if you adopt CMS's you know, um, policies when it comes to delivering payment system, um, let's say macro, if you're going to run with it, you have to understand what this means for our folks. So it's, it's a multilateral type of effort that we're trying to do there. But in terms of the consumer, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can uh, reach that group. Because I feel as though if you can't even get the providers, God, the challenge of getting consumers engaged and understanding what all this means for them is even more difficult. And, and I would take the sort of three steps up level, um, because I think everything Daniel said is critically important. But I think we we... Some of us, because we've been so focused on 1557 and spent a lot of time and energy on that, waiting until that comes. But now I do think you're right that we should be thinking about how we can influence the policymakers here in D.C. And so both at the HHS level and also at the congressional level, going through the Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, uh, and also their friends like the Progressive Caucus. I think there is an education piece. And and HELP does um, co-chair the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights Healthcare Task Force. That might be um, an arena where we can at least start to have some of the conversations. We're also very active in the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities. So I do completely agree, Cincy. I think um, it's been hard because we've all been so for, uh, you know, charging forward with just getting the basics of the ACA implemented, um, but we can't leave leave this to chance at this point, and we are a little bit behind, so we have some catch-up to do, but I do think there are some opportunities we have, both in sort of the, the congressional side as well as the administrative side, to do some education and hopefully at least get them aware of this and take some of the steps that would be important to consider as they're going forward with implementation. Thank you. Uh, I'm Madeline Shea. I'm the Deputy Director of the CMS Office of Minority Health. <laughs> I kind of champion the, de the development of the CMS Equity Plan. Very good. Uh, so I just wanted to say, in terms of your question about data, that it's really important that um, we, for the first time, we release stratified quality measures for Medicare Advantage plans in, in CMS's history mm -hmm. last month. Um, but that's just the beginning. Um, I think we need advocacy that we would have here that the best way to measure how we're doing on our equity agenda is to stratify and report all data yes. as opposed to separate things in addition to health equity uh, uh, compendium or however that's going to roll out. But also um, because the equity CMS equity plan in its six priorities includes a priority that is around communication and accessibility in terms of communication as well as physical accessibility, we're already deep into planning of how we're going to uh, partner in, in the rollout of 1557 and invite you to contact us if, if we can work together. Can I, can I actually follow up and ask you a question? Just one <laughs> so I'm curious, with the equity plan, one of the things that we spoke with um, uh, Kara James and Andy Slavitt about was the fact that um, the plan really should have done more to address GME issues, right? To include that um, critical group of folks in the pipeline, um, to require some level of cultural competency training, et cetera. And it didn't go there. And then in terms of um, you know, community health workers, 
uh, we appreciate folks doing that. But when you talked about diversity, there you all shied away from racial and ethnic diversity. And we're curious why that might have been. Do you could, could you maybe talk in about that of, issue? In terms of GME, um, that. Uh, medical education. Graduate, graduate medical, medical education. Yeah. yeah, graduate medical education. So in terms of professional education, the priorities for the plan came from an environmental scan, what are the gaps, what's been done, what have others said, but then going out and having six listening sessions across mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. And this um, area of GME did come from them. They said, you need to be working on that. The problem is CMS doesn't hold that lever. That The levers there are at HRSA. And so we appreciated and we talked with leadership about how can we, so CMS pays for this education, but they do not, they do not control the quality of it. So that happens at HRSA. We've been in discussions about how we can work better. We appreciate that that is an area where there could be a lot more progress. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't, so we could have put a lot of time into it with no results is ultimately the decision we came to. Community health workers also came from listening sessions. People across the country said, what are you doing to help modernize the workforce mm -hmm. and really to allow to have more multidisciplinary um, health care workforce in general? Um, and again, a lot of this is under HRSA, but there was no way we could say no because everyone put it as a top priority mm -hmm. for our action. So it's there. We're still working on it. Uh, and that's kind of where that happened. So the priorities sure came from a lot of listening of consumers, um, but also stakeholders, other stakeholders across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're almost out of time. I know we've got a question on the front row here, and then we may have time for one oh. more over there. Hi, I'll be brief. Uh, John Young, and actually I have the opportunity to work at CMS for about 12 years, so maybe I can say some things that she might have <laughs> 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 But with that work. being said, I, I get the thing that Mara is talking about. Uh, there seems to be or the need of an integrative effort across the host of regulations and so forth. For instance, uh, you talked about our <coughs> MACRA, that little piece called MIPS as well. There's an opportunity to really address health equity there, but I don't think we're at the table to really impact and influence right. that. Then I look at ICD-10. So if I begin to connect those two together, if you look at ICD-10, there's just this whole host of social determinants of health that we just haven't seen before. So how do you begin to integrate those two and then begin to really make some impact across regulations and legislations and, and legislation around health equity, if you will? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a challenge. I mean, there's always the challenge of we all have lots more to do than funding resources and time allow. But I think we are seeing progress. And I think we point to the ACA. And you know, when I started at NHELP, I did a lot of work on data collection and language access. And it took us a while. But we did get to a point where we had the better policies in place that we could then move forward with the implementation. So we got more funding. We got more resources. We got more documents. Translated CMS agreed to translate Medicare documents into 15 languages. That was a breakthrough. It took, you know, five years of advocacy. So um, I think we can see some progress. There's a lot more to be done. And I think what we're looking for, and in part why we wanted to have this event, is to really kick off and say, we need to bring back a lot of the energy and the focus and the coordination that we did through this working group and take it to the next steps. And NHELP is very committed to doing that. And we would love to partner with lots of folks, everyone in this room and beyond, to figure out how to do that. You know, what are those concrete pieces that we can make some forward progress on in the short term and some that are going to need medium or long term efforts? And so we'd love to find ways. You know, we're not a group that does a lot with ICD. Um, 10, thank you, I was going to say 9, I know we're beyond that. <laughs> but that's exactly where the partnerships are critical. And because it's a big piece of Medicaid and claims, you know, we do care about that. And we have the, the legal expertise and some of the other expertise. So I think that's what really we were hoping is to, to really kick off a conversation and then figure out what the next steps are and hopefully bringing people back together for conversations and maybe, you know, some coalition work and some working group work that we really can move together in, in a lot of these areas. Thanks. Okay, last question over there. Thank you. I'm Deborah Frazier, CEO of the National Healthy Start Association, and thank you all for your work on equity and disparities, and to Congressman Christensen for her unwavering support with National Healthy Start Association um, in her tenure in Congress. Um, Healthy Start works in the area of, of disparities, and infant mortality has decreased in the country, but the, the gap in disparities has widened um, because 
the white infant mortality has improved and babies of color are still dying um, at a higher rate. But um, Healthy Start has been very successful at reducing infant mortality in the communities where we work. Um, and uh, Healthy Start works um, with the community in a culturally appropriate way using community health workers for the last 25 years. And we're the brainchild of Dr. Sullivan, and I have to say that with the Sullivan Alliance sitting here next to me. Um, but, I, and, I, and I want to say that this, this is a model with community health workers and working communities that, that works and it works very well. And we spend a lot of time educating our consumers, our moms and our dads, on the social determinants of, of health that, um, that helps them and empowers them on what they need to do. And at the association level, we also have been very, um, we're working in, to enroll folks in ACA. Now the flip side of that is the more we get them enrolled, the more their providers also need to be educated and they need to be educated about what to expect and what to, um, and what they need. So we'd be very open to working with you um, moving forward in, in, in that area. Terrific. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're about out of time. I want to thank all of our speakers and our panelists for a really wonderful, thoughtful presentation. So join me in thanking them, please. <laughs>